I welcome you to the 2020 Summer Franciscan Zoom Lectures hosted by the Franciscan School of Theology. Dr. Maureen Day is the Assistant Professor of Religion and Society at the Franciscan School of Theology and Research Fellow at CARA in Georgetown University. She has published numerous books and articles on American Catholic life, including her new book, Catholic Activism Today, and her 2018 edited collection, Young Adult American Catholics. She provides her expertise to the church as a member of the Alliance for Campus Ministry, an advisory group to the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. Her current book project, co-authored with Michelle Dillon, will report the findings from a national survey of American Catholics. I welcome Maureen. Hi, thank you, Michelle. Uh, so thanks for um, watching this video. It's great to have um, people interested in young adults today. It's a, what I think is a really important ministry, um, an often overlooked group, and a group that's um, getting more and more attention. You know, with the recent synod the Pope called, um, more and more people are starting to, to wonder um, what to do with this group of, of young adults. So my talk tonight is um, Young Adult Catholics, Why Questions Are Better Than Answers. And so just to begin with, I wanted to outline why I think questions are better than answers. Um, and what, so what, the, what the, that subtitle is and how it plays a role um, in tonight's talk. Um, first of all, questions um, are really important as a pastoral practice. And one of the things that questions do is they invite humility and awe, right? So questions, um, rather than us telling people um, the answers, questions invite other people to share their experiences, their hopes, their fears, their needs. Um, and then we get to listen. We get to open up. Um, we get to put our own perspectives aside and hear the voices and experiences from others. And that should really instill in us a sense of awe and wonder in another human being. And so the, these so questions help us hone our pastoral practices in listening. Another reason that questions are really important as a pastoral practice is that they allow for discovery. So we can learn new and amazing and exciting things um, when we um, can remember that we don't know everything and that other people can be sources of truth and beauty and enlightenment as well. And so questions are a great way um, rather than covering things, covering material, getting information of discovering um, new things about others and about ourselves. So one of the things questions also then in allowing for discovery is allowing us to learn. Um, it's a, a learning as a pastoral practice. And then the final piece uh, why I want to talk about questions being better than answers is that questions are a beginning, right? Answers sometimes can be an end. They can uh, end up terminating um, a conversation and, and that's it. Um, questions are always a beginning. There's always at least one more step. And I think good answers, to give answers a little bit of credit here, good answers should always have an implicit question that points us to something different and beyond itself. Um, but questions will always be a beginning to something else. And so questions in their sense of starting something and of practice, really practicing that listening and that learning um, can help us to better accompany people. So questions can help us get at the practice of listening, learning, and accompaniment. And this is what's really important, I think, when we are talking about ministry with young adults today, is to be extremely attentive that we are not providing as many answers as we are asking questions um, and getting at that listening and learning and accompaniment. So with that, um, before we get into what's going on in the lives of young adults today, I wanted to offer some definitions. So um, first of all, we, when we talk about young adults, there's a few different definitions that people use, and I wanted to just kind of lay them out out there and give you some vocabulary terms so that when I switch back and forth between things, uh, you'll know what, ex what groups exactly I'm talking about. So the Vatican uses the term young people, um, and when they refer, so when they talk about the synod and young people, um, they're talking about um, Catholics, or actually just people generally, who are between the ages of 16 to 29. Um, when the USCCB uses the term young adult, they're referring to people 19 to 39. Uh, and then when the US, USCCB refers to Hispanic ministry, specifically jóvenes, uh, they're referring to people between the ages of 16 and 30. Uh, and then we can also talk about generational groups. So unlike, so young people, you know, people begin younger than young people or young adults, and they 
age into that category and then they age out of that core category. But we also can talk about generations. So millennials um, are gonna be millennials uh, until the day they die, right? So they don't get to leave that category like we might leave young adulthood. Um, but millennials are those born between um, 1981 and 1996. People will kind of you know, push those dates a little earlier, a little um, later, but this is pretty much the consensus. Um, which means that in 2020, those are folks between the ages of 24 and 39. And so our younger young adults are referred to, sometimes people call them Gen Z, I, I call them iGen. And probably because I'm from the Gen X generation, we never got a real name, so I don't want people um, to have, be stuck with Gen Z. So the iGen group um, are people who were born 1997 and later. And um, those are, so as far as adults go, those would be the people who are between 18 and 23. All right, so just to talk about um, the US population broadly. Um, when we look in at 2015 data, um, there's the US population that was raised Catholic. 32% of people in 2015, if they were asked what population, or what, sorry, what religion, tradi what religious tradition you're raised in, 32% of the United States would say Catholic. Um, and then, but then when we said, when we looked at those who were raised Catholic, and we said, what tradition do you identify with today? 18.5% um, or 59% of the original sample um, said that you still identified as Catholic. Whereas 13% of the nation or 41% of those raised Catholic did not identify as Catholic any longer. So when people talk about young adults leaving the church, um, this is something that is actually happening across all age groups. It's happening most um, predominantly, oh, it's overrepresented among those who are youngest, um, but it's really uh, a, a situation, an issue, a problem, a challenge that we can see across um, demographics. It's really mind blowing when we think about the fact that 13% of people in the United States were raised Catholic and no longer identify as such. Um, and this, this percentage is of people disaffiliating from Catholicism um, is increasing. So when they asked these same questions in 2007, they found that 69% um, that of people who were raised Catholic still identified as Catholic, but um, only, and only 31% of people um, no longer did. So we're looking at about two thirds to a third, where now we're moving in a direction where that chunk of people who still retain a Catholic identity in adulthood is decreasing. So in just eight years, we see noticeable shifts in those percentages. And as far as people who leave the church, um, you know, we can ask the question, well, are they replaced by people um, coming into RCIA? Does that keep our numbers stable? And the answer is that it doesn't. Um, if you look at Catholics, even though um, a lot of traditions are losing membership um, at this point in our nation's um, history, uh, it is Catholics who we, we really see losing the most. So for every one Catholic who comes into the Catholic Church um, through the RCIA process, 6.5 Catholics leave the Catholic Church. This is much higher, as you can see, um, than these other traditions. And for every one person who um, who leaves the unaffiliated category, people who don't identify with any religious tradition. You know, so that means they would switch into um, a religious tradition. Um, 4.2 people join that no religion category. So we see a lot of um, denominations are losing membership, Catholics even more so. And then what's growing are people who don't identify with any religious tradition at all. Um, and so this has spawned you know, a, a lot of research on, on Catholic young adults, young adults more generally as well, um, to understand the religious and spiritual lives of people in those different age groups. Um, one really interesting study that I want to start off with, um, the Christian Smith, he's a sociologist at Notre Dame, um, has led a national study that looked at teens, um, 13 to 18, and then he interviewed and so he interviewed and surveyed that group, and then he had another um, Five years later, he went back to that same group of kids who had now become adults. They were then 18 to 23. And then they had a third wave of studies where, uh, of interviews and surveys where they were following up with that group um, when they were between the ages of 24 and 28. And um, many books came out of all, all of that really rich data set. Um, one of the books um, looks just at the Catholic data. So not all of the different spiritual traditions that their national sample had but just the Catholics who are between the ages of 18 and 23. 
And that book is called Young Catholic America, covers right there. Um, and it really wants to look at the factors that contribute to the growth and decline um, in Catholic and uh, young adult Catholic religiosity. Um, so even among those who, so this book's really valuable also because it doesn't only say, do you affiliate or disaffiliate and put you in one of those two categories, but it also measures um, to what extent you are practicing or believing um, or participating in the Catholic tradition. And what they found was there were three primary factors because what they found, first of all, was that very, uh, there's a very low percentage of Catholics with high religiosity in that 18 to 23 age group. Um, but they found that for those who do have a high religiosity, um, what were the factors in their teen years? So they could look back at the teen data and see how were these young adults different um, or how were these young adults different as teens compared to their peers? Um, and what they found were three primary factors that led to high um, adult religiosity. And that was that they had close relationships to religiously committed and supportive family and friends. Um, the parents are by far the most important in all of these. They're, it obviously can't be determinative, um, but that having high religiosity parents of all of the different relationships um, kids could have. So think um, youth ministers, Catholic high school teachers, confirmation sponsors, those sorts of things. Parents had the most influence of any group. Um, but then other, um, other adults that are also grounded in their faith, such as those sponsors and youth ministers, can make a really big difference. Um, and then also internalizing Catholic beliefs. So it wasn't just a matter of um, knowing what the church taught, but actually having um, a sense of believing those doctrines and teachings. And then also having regular religious um, behaviors and practices. So it wasn't just the beliefs though either and believing them, but actually having some sort of ritualized or routine um, practices that they'd integrated into their life. So those were the three main factors. But another thing that they did was they, as I said, they not only surveyed a, a large group of, um, of Catholics in the 18 to 23 group, but they also interviewed a subset of them. So I think it was 40, I think these numbers should add up to 41 if I remember correctly. Um, and I won't go into each of these categories and um, you can read more up on, on these if you'd want, but just to give you an example. So the least religious group they called the apostate group and seven of their 41 and um, young adults fell into that group. And to be an apostate, um, the definition they used was you weren't involved in religion, you were critical of the church, and you don't want even a nominal Catholic identity. Uh, and then so they said that this group was probably the least likely to return of all of the groups that they looked at. Um, and then the most religious group that they were looking for was, was what they called a devout group. Um, none of the teens, um, or sorry, they, none of the young adults, the 18 to 23 year olds met this criteria. So their definition of, of devout was regular attenders who find their faith personally meaningful and agree with most church teachings. So none of them met that criteria. However, a dozen, which um, is a fairly large group when we look at the other numbers, did qualify as engaged. And so the way that they defined that was that they were either regular attenders who find their faith to be important, but disagree with several church teachings, or they could be irregular attenders who find faith to be important and find it personally meaningful to be Catholic. So this was the kind of way, but we can see, and there were teens um, who met and who fell into this higher, these higher religiosity categories when they did the teen study. So we see that religious identity begins to wane in this 18 to 23 year old age group. Uh, so, the, so in addition to the Smith book, another valuable book um, is Kaya Oakes's book. I do want to clarify that um, Smith's book is, and Smith, and, and he has some co-authors in there as well, um, but Smith's book is, is very um, methodologically rigorous, um, you know, really uses those kind of traditional methods, uh, large samples, that sort of thing. Um, or Kaya Oaks, she does not have that same sort of rigorous method that she's holding herself to. Um, but what she's doing is she's um, going out and talking to young adults and seeing what their experiences are and asking them to tell their stories. And she's looking for themes across those. So while we wouldn't treat um, Kaya Oaks's book with the same sort of academic rigor, it's still um, extremely insightful to see what sort of experiences animate and um, people who do not necessarily, who do no longer identify as Catholicism, with Catholicism. So her book title was called The Nuns Are All Right, um, which looks at um, meaning, belonging, and seeking among young adults. Um, what's, 
so even though she's concentrating on unaffiliated young adults generally, she does have a few chapters on Catholics specifically. Um, and so I'm going to go into those a little more in a little more depth here. Um, but what she notices in those when she's talking about the spirituality among disaffiliated and marginal Catholics is that across the board, she found that people who were once Catholic, she uses the phrase, are God haunted. And um, that there's this sense that they are still, that there's this connection um, that still remains, e even though they're not quite sure what to do with it. Um, and so just to look at a couple of the different groups that she talks to, first of all, she talks to returners. And um, so people who have left Catholicism and then come back. And um, she asks them about what their time away was like and what caused them to return and how they feel um, upon returning. And so what returners, um, what she realizes that returners realize about themselves is that the issues that caused the people to leave Catholicism are still there when they return. So these were typically people who left because of some sort of um, church teaching they disagreed with. Um, and so when they come back, that church teaching is still there. And so they're trying to find ways to navigate this tension. Um, and what she found was that community is key. So finding a place where you can um, still have a sense of belonging while you have that, um, while you wrestle with whatever sort of teachings you disagree with. That's really important in um, finding and discovering a Catholic identity for returners. Um, another important piece to think about is helping returners recognize Catholicism's interpretive diversity. It's a phrase Michelle Dillon uses in her book, Post-Secular Catholicism. And for example, she does, she does a great example, Michelle Dillon does a great example of talking about this when she's looking at um, the Synod on the Family that took place. So we have cardinals and bishops and, and many other people gathering in Rome to talk about family life. And we realize that when we talk about family life, there's gonna be disagreements within the Catholic tradition, depending on what sort of ecclesiologies a cardinal or bishop wants to emphasize, what sort of theologies, what uh, theology of family that a person might wanna amplify over another one. And so we see that there's actually a lot of of, um, there's a spectrum and the, there's constellations uh, that um, Catholicism has within it that she calls interpretive diversity. And helping returners see that um, and seeing kind of the, the montage and the history and the, the tensions that um, characterize the Catholic tradition are really important for returners. Um, and also something that um, parishes that um, receive returners, um, what they can appreciate is that we should recognize returners as gifted um, because Returners can see things that not all of us can see. They're able to see why people leave Catholicism as well as why they stay or why they come back, right? And so they can offer us some wisdom and insight from their own experiences as well. Kaya Oaks also just talked about those who, or talked to those who left Catholicism and did not see the, did not have the idea of returning in their future. And what they experienced was a great sense of loss and loneliness. They knew that, um, you know, in the great cost benefit analysis that they had to leave Catholicism, um, but that there was a still, you know, in that analysis, a great deal of loss that, that they weren't going to be able to fill with other things. Um, listening, um, she, she found, is one of the greatest ministerial practices for those who've left Catholicism. And they often are characterized by a sense of what if. You know, they can trace out the, the kind of the milestones or the events or the experiences that they've had in Catholicism over the course of their biography and wonder, you know, what if this had been different? What if I hadn't been overlooked at this moment? And what if someone more directly reached out to me at this time? And so there's this sense of what if um, that, that always, that seemed to really characterize those who, who had left Catholicism. Another book that doesn't have the same sort of um, methodological rigor as something, for example, of Christian Smith's is The Going, Going, Gone. A lot of people have um, heard of this booklet. Um, it's, it, is, it does have a, two pages of the booklet are based on CARA data, which is, um, you know, CARA is, is well known for its methodological rigor in quantitative studies of um, American Catholics. Um, but so two pages of the booklet, uh, it's a roughly 30 page booklet um, are characterized by that. And, but the remaining 28 or so pages um, really dive into interviews. And so 
But the only thing that I, I did some cautionary with this book is that their sample size was really small. So they interviewed folks, 15 people, um, which it would was a pretty small sample size. So we don't want to be too um, treat the feel, treat the findings um, with too much gravity, and um, we might want to you know, be a little modest about the way that we draw conclusions with that. But it, we should consider it as a good exploratory work um, to start thinking about things and seeing how it connects or um, illuminates different things from other studies. Um, so again, so they look, they interviewed people who were between the ages of 15 to 25 um, and wanted to see why they had left Catholicism. And so some of the highlights that I wanted to bring out from that book, you know, and so um, Smith's book talked about not people leaving Catholicism, his 18 to 23 year olds, but people just sort of drifted. That was the trend that he saw in that. Um, that it wasn't that they were hostile, uh, the, it wasn't the vast majority of people were hostile towards Catholicism, it was just that um, they kind of drifted, you know, leaving the home kind of made them disconnect a bit, not having that kind of Sunday compulsion that you needed to go. Um, and then their life, um, when they were kind of more loosely tethered to the church, became filled with other obligations, career, school, um, romantic relationships, other friendships, that sort of thing. Um, and so there was more of a drifting in Smith's work. Um, whereas in Going, Going, Gone, what they found was that disaffiliation is a thoughtful, conscious, and intentional choice. Um, among, so it's very different um, findings. Um, but what Going, Going, Gone is in agreement with is there's a book called The 20-something Soul that I'm going to discuss as well. Um, and th that is something that they found among those who had, had left religion. Um, and, you know, in comparison to others, you know, like we talked about Kaya Oaks, that there's a sense of loss for those who leave Catholicism. Um, in Going, Going, Gone, then the people who were interviewed describe themselves as feeling free and relieved um, once they've left Catholicism. Um, something that's really, I think, valuable to this booklet is that they highlight the causes of disaffiliation. So even though, you know, this is a small sample size and will be exploratory, this, is, this could be really insightful for us to, to think some more about. Um, but basically, they found three reasons people leave. First of all, that they were injured. Um, they had poor experiences with life. Um, you know, kind of like, what, how could a just and loving God have let this happen to me? Um, or they had um, poor experiences with people of faith. So for example, um, if they knew someone who, um, you know, really embraced their Catholicism, talked about what a great Catholic they were, and then they found out some sort of like um, moral catastrophe, that they had made this really terrible moral choice. They would see a lot of hypocrisy there and they would, you know, regardless of whether or not this person um, was a church leader or, you know, just their uncle sort of thing, it, it could cause a lot of dissonance and hypocrisy and they would, wouldn't want anything to do with that. Um, so in addition to being injured, they did find people that they said were just drifters and indifferent about their faith, which is interesting given their own definition of um, disaffiliation being a thoughtful, conscious, and intentional choice. And then there were dissenters, um, people who had disagreements with a specific doctrine, um, a teaching of the church that just, they said, you know, I can't belong to a religion that teaches that. So those were the three kind of main reasons they saw people leaving Catholicism in this eight, in this 15 to 25 age group. All right, so now I wanna shift gears a little bit and take a step back and look at a sociological classic from the 1950s called Exit Voice and Loyalty. Um, and so what Exit Voice and Loyalty talk about, and here's my volcano queued up, um, is that basically every organization is, is going to experience tensions, um, some sort of, uh, sometimes it's gonna get to even the level of crisis at points. And then when crisis happens, tensions build. Um, we, have, we have real struggles and we're not sure what to do with it. And as the tensions mount and mount, there usually comes a breaking point in any organization. And when I say organization, it could be, interpret that very broadly. It could be a family, it could be a place of employment, it could be an organization, it could, you know, you name it. Um, the, an example I'll use is that, uh, just to something really small, um, imagine, for example, you were really dedicated to a specific brand of toothpaste because they made a really great wintergreen um, toothpaste flavor. You thought it was great. You couldn't imagine going anywhere else. And all of a sudden, one day you go to the store and there's no wintergreen there. And you find out that they no longer make a wintergreen toothpaste. So suddenly you're at this point, you're at this volcano point. 
and you have three choices that you need to make. This is what the, 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 the social theorists say. People either exit and in the face of an institutional crisis, they give voice and they talk about, um, to people in authority positions, they talk about their, their disagreement with what's going on or loyalty. They will quiet themselves. They'll think about, um, you know, the, the, is this the battle I want to pick? Is it worth it? Sort of thing. So for example, going back to our toothpaste example, exit would be, you know what? I really need wintergreen. If this brand can't give it to me, I'm going to go somewhere else. I'm going to start using that brand. A voice would be calling, a, calling, writing a letter to the company, telling them that, you know, the wintergreen was really great. Can you um, consider bringing it back? And then loyalty is, you know, this brand has a lot going for it. I've, you know, other than this little mishap, I'm sure that they're going to make great flavors. So I'm going to stick with this brand. I'm just going to switch flavors. Um, and, you know, as long as they keep producing quality project, products, I don't need my wintergreen, right? So those, that's the examples within that. Um, we see, so we saw, we've been talking a lot about exit lately. Um, when we're looking at these sociological literature. And exit does tell us something important. It tells us that people are leaving and it helps us see when we can get um, people who exit to talk, we get to hear about that. But what we can really maximize um, pastoral, our pastoral um, efficacy is through listening to the voice. So when people are actually talking and speaking and um, concerned, they, and they bring us this voice, Voice is really important, not just for helping um, solidify and rejuvenate a community when it's at that um, point of tension or crisis, but it's also really important because voice helps us understand why people have left. So voice, um, vo the people who are giving voice to their concerns are not only speaking for the voice group, but in a way they're often also speaking for the exit group. So we can get a lot of insight um, from folks who give voice to us. So I, ha I have an edited collection, as Michelle introduced in the beginning, um, called Young Adult American Catholics, and it really amplifies that voice tradition. Um, so going into this a little more deeply, just to tell you how it's laid out. So it looks at, um, it's an edited collection, which means it has contri co people contributing from all different sorts of groups. So the 13 groups that it looks at are undergrads, emerging adults, parents, lay associations, um, lots of different types of young adult Catholics here. Um, and the way each section is introduced, typically a sociologist will kind of give us the lay of the land, you know, the big picture data. So for undergrads, for example, it would tell us um, how many Catholic institutions there are, how many Catholic undergrads there are, non-Catholic institutions. Um, and then it goes into two to six voices. So it, then it will be followed by um, two to six people who are actually from that population. So in the undergrads, for example, they, um, you'll have two to six undergrads that you'll actually hear them writing about what they need from the church, what they've received from the church, and, and what their sense of vocation is, um, given their formation that they've had so far. And then it also finally concludes with questions, because as you know, I think questions are better than answers. So rather than giving you a best practices, which may work in some contexts, but may do really poorly in other contexts, um, I provide questions for people to consider their own ministerial context and how to bring the insights of the group that's featured in that, that little, that subgroup that's featured in that section, how to bring it to your own context. Um, and so just to um, look, go into this a little bit further, what I'll be sharing with you is the emerging adults section, because that tends to be a really eclectic group um, to, to listen to with a variety of experiences. So emerging adulthood, in case you're not familiar with the term, um, basically, it's something that didn't exist in previous generations. Previous generations had a very, had a pretty sharp transition into adulthood. So you can imagine graduating high school, hitting that 18 year mark. Um, in the 1950s to 1965 or so, marriage age was at an all time low for the century. And, and people and the economy was booming. So you had these, you had people typically men entering into careers uh, immediately after high school. Some would go on to college, but then after college, definitely entering into a career. So we had a real quick transition from adolescence into adulthood. And now people are postponing a lot of those uh, major milestones um, of adulthood and, and giving them until they reach that full adulthood. So before, you know, 22, 23, you were, you were nearly most certainly an adult by that time. Um, but now we have these, these markers that are getting postponed later and later. So we hear about people having a gap year between high school and college. Um, 
a lot more people are taking lengthier internships or term or years of service um, after their career or, or traveling or even you know doing the gig economy thing and cobbling a few different things together. Um, and marriage and having children aren't necessary. It doesn't go the marriage and then children route. You know, one in three children roughly are born outside of marriage. Um, so marriage is not necessary before um, having children anymore socially. And um, we also see people getting married a lot later, having that first child a lot later than previously. So we see all of these markers and things that we've considered, you know, um, being a full adult um, that are happening much later now. And so what are the consequences of this? Is this longer period of time um, after high school and into this kind of final um, ending uh, of uh, into full adulthood has given people roughly a decade or so um, a creative time to explore themselves. And so this is, this is what we refer to when we're talking about emerging adulthood. And so the sociologist that wrote the, um, the, the introduction piece to the emerging adults is um, Dr. Kathleen Garces Foley. We'll, we'll look at her work too here in a second um, and in another book that she wrote. But what she, when she talks about Catholics who are in their 20s um, and late teens, um, one in three of those um, live with a parent still. So this is, again, something that, that didn't happen a couple generations ago, not at, not at this rate. 47%, um, you know, we talked a lot about exit. Um, that, that's not true for everyone. 47% of people 18 to 29 say religion is, uh, of the Catholics, 18 to 29 say religion is very or somewhat important to them. Um, when we look at social media, oh, so, sorry, young adults look at social media and the Facebook responses especially to see who's going to be an event, right? So if the diocese, uh, oh, and also um, young adults don't need to be tethered to a parish anymore. These emerging adults, um, they enjoy going to St. Monica's for one thing, St. Michael's for another thing, and they tend to kind of hover over a region rather than feel particularly wedded to one, just one parish. So diocesan or deanery events um, tends to attract um, fairly large crowds. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And the 20-somethings um, also sometimes don't want to be lumped in with the 30-somethings. They feel like they're too different um, from one another. And this, is, and, and this isn't true across the board. These are just general trends that ha have been found. Um, also, they don't, they tend to not um, want singles events. Like, there are exceptions, obviously. Um, but things like mixers and that sort of things that churches would do a couple generations ago for singles groups isn't, isn't um, what they're looking for from their own young adult groups. Um, and also something to note is that some emerging adults um, Want, look for priests who prioritize a magisterial authority, um, while a large number still, um, they want an inclusive pastor who's non-judgmental. Um, and that tends to be the larger group, that second piece. Um, and then when we looked at, so there was I had six or so um, folks in this section who talked about their own experience as an emerging adult, what it meant to them. And I'm just gonna read you a short excerpt of one um, that was entitled Overcoming Fear and Emerging into Adult Faith by Teresia McCarthy. And just to give you a little background on um, Benny, Benny is her, the name she goes by. Her name was Teresia, her name is Teresia Benedicta McCarthy. And um, she was named after Edith Stein. So Edith Stein um, was, was um, her cause for saying that she was named Blessed Edith Stein at one point because she was martyred in the Second World War. And when she, she was born Edith Stein and she became a nun and she took the name Teresia Benedicta when she became a nun and her parents had such admiration for her that they named their youngest of 12 daughter, who you see pictured here, um, after her, after her name in religious life. Um, and then when she was a very young child, she nearly died of a Tylenol overdose. She was, I can't remember the number exactly, around 17 times over the lethal dose. Um, and her parents and family and friends, everyone rallied around and prayed for the intercession of St. Edith Stein, or not at that point, she wasn't a saint, um, to, to intercede and to cure her. And her, um, her healing was considered a miracle by the Vatican, and it was the miracle that led to the canonization of Edith Stein, which is why she's here in picture with Pope John Paul II and um, receiving communion at that liturgy where she was canonized. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background on this um, and how that, how that experience impacted her and her young adult faith. Many times in my life, I felt lost, 
because I was so unsure of where I was supposed to be and what my purpose was. My miraculous recovery from a Tylenol overdose is what led to the canonization of St. Edith Stein. I often thought when I was young that because of this miracle, I was supposed to do something great in this world. After all, she did. I was named after the name she took upon entering religious life. She was martyred and interceded for me. It made sense from a certain perspective that God expected great things from me too. Because I never saw this great thing in my life, I felt like a failure, causing me to struggle with depression and anxiety for many years. I believe now my vocation is not one obvious thing, but that I have been called to do many things and it is in how I do them that they become my calling. And so you have um, her full story there, um, plus another five or so emerging adults alongside of her, each sharing really different experiences. Um, and then you have questions. So like just to, uh, just to give you the, the last one as a sample, um, these essays demonstrated a very large diversity of young adult needs. When was the last time your parish held a focus group to hear one of the Hear the needs of the unmarried adults in the community, if never hold one. Um, what are some of the steps you take in meeting these needs that can incorporate spirituality, relationship, and service? These themes are common to many of the essays here. So it helps you think through um, ways to revamp your ministry using voice, um, these voices of young adults who are very candidly um, speaking about their lives, their experiences, and what they um, what they see as their vocation and what they need from the church in order to help actualize that vocation. And then, so then finally to return to that exit voice and loyalty theme, um, as I talked to you, we were gonna talk about um, Kathleen Garces Foley and she also co-authored the book with Tim Clydesdale. They wrote the book, The 20 Something Soul and um, their book looks at, uh, and so this is a great example of a book that looks at loyalty. Um, so they look at Catholics who are actively, um, as well as um, more, um, more, a little slightly more estranged from the church, but everyone who identifies, um, they look at people who identify as Catholic, mainline Protestant, and evangelical Protestant, as well as people who identify as no religious tradition. And they ask them a variety of um, spirituality and um, question, questions about their spiritual beliefs, practices, attitudes toward the world, and that sort of thing. Um, and so this, so just to share, I'm just going to share some of the findings from their Catholic chapter um, with you today. And again, loyalty is, is the, the, the thing that this book offers us. Um, so what it helps explore is what are the differences among those who remain Catholic? So, you know, among the, uh, the variety of people who are, who, I, who do identify as Catholic, um, there's a different degrees of belief and practice that we see within that group. And so they've classified Catholics, um, the 20 something Catholics that they talk to um, as active, nominal or estranged. And so just to give you a little bit of, on the active Catholics. So the way they define active Catholics means that they attend at least a couple of times per month and they indicate that spiritual growth is at least very important. Um, and then the three most fa important factors for active Catholics um, in, to a, in selecting a parish was community, um, spiritual experiences, and church leadership. So just to unpack all of these a little bit. So community, first of all, uh, regardless of what sort of theology or ecclesiology or other experiences that, Catholics, that these 20-something Catholics brought to the table, um, there were four really kind of common themes to community, and that was that the community was what they characterized as friendly, welcoming, inviting, and non-judgmental. Another thing was important um, for the young adults here was that ha was having a critical young mass of young adults who quote look like me, and um, so and just to clarify and just to give you the quote too that I thought was a really great quote, um, they went one of the churches that they went to was packed for their young adult mass, um, so packed that there were people standing in the vestibule, uh, at, you know, outside of the, the church uh, sanctuary proper. And this is, she, they said, why would you come to church when they're, it's so crowded here, you could go down the street to another church. And the person responded, I'd rather stand with people who look like me than sit with people who don't. Um, and so just to clarify to that, like me um, refers to age here, um, but it also correlates with being a college grad and aspiring to the middle class. But it does not mean race or ethnicity. This particular person who said this phrase uh, was Asian American 
and he was in a predominantly white um, parish context. But it was a sense that um, I'm here and I'm belonging with other youth, um, that that was relevant for their spiritual experience and sense of community. Also having opportunities to socialize and connect with one another. <coughs> Sorry about that. And then um, a lot of parishes that were most successful were ones that had niche demographics. So they had folks that were in their 20s um, versus you know, the 30s as well. Um, having a young marrieds group um, was important for them or maybe having people who were young um, and with kids in their own separate group. So you're not lumping all of the children's ministry or family ministry folks together or all the married people into one group. They wanted to stay with their age group. And part of this might be a kind of, of an artifact from this study because the way they found their parishes um, is they, they, they looked at the parishes that had the best reputation for attracting large numbers of young adults. So, you know, when you think about the way young adult ministry happens, for example, in the San Diego diocese, there are a few parishes that stand out as magnet parishes that have really large numbers of young adults. But on, and then on the flip side though, is that there's still like, a significant young adult presence at other churches as well. So maybe there might be um, a, you know, a pretty, uh, maybe there's five or six people who are um, core members in the young adult group at one parish, maybe another dozen at the other one. So just to, to remember to the way their methods might affect the, what they found. Um, another thing that was important uh, as far as a factor goes is spiritual experiences. So having the Eucharist is was across the board a, a universal um, universally important experience for these people, but having young adults participating in any spiritual experiences were, was important too. So they were not looking for intergenerational ministries, um, which has important um, implications and downsides and challenges as well. So it's something that, that a minister would want to consider, um, but just something to know. Um, and also finally, um, leadership was really important. And like I said earlier, so they wanted a priest who embodies their own sense of Catholicity whether that meant um, you know, really prioritizing magisterial authority or whether that meant being welcoming and non-judgmental. Um, but having a priest, that the, especially the pastor, um, who kind of set the tone for that was really important for the young adults. Um, and then there was also the nominal and estranged group. So, 20, so we just were talking about the active folks. 22% of uh, the Catholics in the survey were, uh, were classified as active. Um, on the other extreme, so we have the active over here, on the other side is the, the estranged, they were the least active, and they were classified as estranged if they attend um, once a year or less, and their spiritual growth is not very or not at all important. Um, so 20% were not, so we have like 22, 20 percent roughly uh, on each end of the extremes, and in the big fat middle um, were 58 percent of the sample, and those were classified as, as nominal. So everyone who was in between. So if you didn't fall neatly into one of those two categories, you were lumped into this nominal category. And um, so when they looked, they said, we want to find out what sort of things are similar to and different across these three groups, the nominal, the estranged, and the active Catholics. And um, so what was similar across all groups is the degrees of loneliness they experienced, their social media use, and have a sense of having purpose or meaning in their lives. Um, they were all really similar in their desire to marry. Um, they, were, they were similar in gender identity as being private or not inconsequential. Um, they were similar in having a sense of spiritual connectedness, um, appreciation of artistic expressions of spirituality, and in similar in borrowing experiences and practices from other faith traditions. Um, so now, but we'll, now we'll go into the differences. What are the other things um, besides just mass attendance and spiritual growth that separate the, these three groups of young adult Catholics. Um, so one of the things we can look at is religious belonging and helping. So active Catholics are a lot more likely as this black bar shows um, to think of oneself as a part of a particular tradition, religion, denomination, church, so forth, um, than are the estranged Catholics. And they're also a lot more um, likely to say that we believe or we have an obligation to help others even if it means personal sacrifice. So um, a stronger sense of belonging and a stronger sense that helping is important um, to, them, to them personally. Um, the theology piece is also um, pretty different across the board. Um, so the active Catholics are much more likely to say that God is a personal being involved in the lives of people today, whereas the estranged Catholics are um, a lot less likely. And this, is, this also holds true for the 
Um, only one religion is true, question they asked. Um, when they asked uh, ask Catholics to ask to um, the, these 20 something Catholics, um, whether or not my deep passion is social justice, the present that agreed with this, and um, we see that active Catholics are much more likely, just over half of active Catholics say agree that yes, my deep passion is social justice. And where this is slightly less for nominal and significantly less for estranged Catholics. And so we go from just over half to around a quarter and, uh, among the, the estranged Catholics. Um, and also seeing faith in everyday life. This is a huge difference if we, we look at these percentage differences. So when we ask people, um, or we say, say, my religious faith is extremely or very important in shaping how I live my daily life. Active Catholics are much more likely, nearly 80% to agree with that statement. Um, whereas we see a, a steep drop for nominal Catholics and hardly any estranged Catholics um, see that any significance in their religious faith in, in their everyday life. Um, individualism and materialism are also um, are and what we say negatively correlated with this. So active Catholics are a lot less likely to say that making a lot of money is very important to their happiness and that all I want out of life is a good is a job that pays well and a partner I can trust. Whereas we see nominal Catholics are more likely to say it and estranged Catholics even more likely um, to say that. And so th those help see, look at the difference between them. So now leaving the 20 something soul and kind of looking also at just at secular trends, um, you know, what's, what's beyond uh, the Catholic church and what's informing and shaping the world that we all inhabit. Um, so what are the, some of the things that form young adults? Uh, service learning, this is one of the first gen young adults come from one of the first generations where service learning is pretty much universal across their high school and college experience and or having you know some sort of community service requirement and millennials were at one point the most racially diverse generation that america had ever seen um, now the igens are passing them so we're seeing increasing religious diversity as the generations um, pass through um, and the, and millennials um, are very aware of that they they don't want to be in a racially homogenous or ethnically homogenous setting. They, they recognize when diversity is lacking and they try to think of ways to, to increase that. Um, collaboration is also um, a, a big piece of it. Um, you know, I think about what my kids, um, as far as collaborative projects, what they work on at school compared to collaboration uh, expectations of when I was um, in high school and even undergraduate degrees. Um, time. There, there's just so much more collaboration happening now in their education. And so, and they enter the workforce ready to collaborate. And so, the, and they also enter into church ministries ready to collaborate. So they're not looking to be the one person who does, who leads X. And um, they're really looking to work with a team. They, they know what their strengths are and what their limits are. And so they want people to help complement what they can do. Um, Cause they know they can produce better things when they work in collaboration with others. And another thing that shapes them is in a way that no other generation has experienced is connectivity and instant gratification. So we, you know, we see the ways that having the, the world at your fingertips and your phone um, and how that has shaped the way um, we interact in the world. Uh, that's, that could be its own talk. <laughs> um, but, and also what inspires them. So art and craft, this is a, a hands-on sort of generation um, that likes to create and appreciate the aesthetics. Um, sustainability, and it's not, it, it is, it includes a sustainability of resources and materials, but it's also a sustainability of self. Um, so they aren't looking to spread themselves too thin, and um, they really do want balance and that sort of thing, and things that are going to be, gen they want to engage in projects and ideas that are going to be generative for them. And they want to also be very mindful of what they're doing. They want it to be um, integrated, they want it to be thoughtful and reflective. Um, and so, I kind of, you know, when I, as I've distilled many, many, many things um, on young adults and what I would kind of bring it down to, if I were to kind of give you a phrase to walk away with, is that young adulthood is characterized by an expressive authenticity that seeks belonging. <clears throat> so that authenticity piece, they really don't want to live those double lives. They really want a sense of integration that they're job and their self and their family and their friends and their church life 
that there's a lot of overlap in these things um, and that they don't feel like they have to step in and out of roles in a real bifurcated or a real compartmentalized sort of way. And so they want that authenticity and it's expressive. So meaning that they like it to be made manifest. They like to see their, their self um, become materialized in some way, whether it's through art, through song, through a project, they like seeing outcomes of, of them as extensions of themselves. Um, and that it seeks belonging. It's not a solo sort of generation. Um, this expressive authenticity is something that's done um, in community, in relationship with others. So given everything we've talked about tonight, what are some ways the church can respond? So I said I don't like answers or best practices, but I do want you to walk away um, with a sense of some, of some um, ideas or some, some, some things that could generate um, some, some new ways of going about um, your practices as church. Um, so one thing is to joyfully use technology. And the joyfully word is not put there as an incidental thing and that you would only read the use technology part. Um, but really, like, again, the authenticity piece is really important for young adults. So when there's a sense that, you know, this is how we tell stories, this is how we come together, you don't, you know, you don't need to have um, just information um, passing through the internet, but how do we connect to one another through the internet? Um, how do we, and we can use giving, we can talk about um, the, cre the creating, the planning, and the implementation of events. You know, there's so many events happening digitally right now with COVID. Um, it can give us some real insights into how to use that sort of technology for, for community building. Um, also, think about ways to be holistic when you're ministering to young adults in your community. So, for example, um, college debt is a really serious problem young adults grapple with. Imagine if you were to do a wide and far-reaching invitation to have, you know, someone from, from some sort of financial planning institution could give a series of talks, maybe on how to reduce your college debt, how to save for a mortgage, and that, those sorts of things that might be really important for young adults and could attract a good number of them. Show that you don't just care about their spiritual life, but all of their, their human um, needs and desires as well. And so that you as a church want to care about not them in one way, but in all ways. So be really holistic in the ways that you think about ministering to young adults in your area. Also make sure that you show impact. Um, young adults really do like to see um, the fruits of what's going on. So if you hold a backpack drive or you, you're doing fundraising, monetary donations, that sort of thing, Show them the results, let them know, you know, this is where we're at today with our goals. Here's, here's the pictures of all the school supplies that we've collected so far. You know, we've got three more days. How many, we need this many more backpacks, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, showing them the impact is important. Um, volunteer opportunities in the outside community um, could also attract a, a good number of young adults. They do like to be involved um, in, in their wider arena. You know, that goes back to um, the, the community and service learning, community service hours and service learning they were probably a part of. Um, an important thing to make sure about is that these are short-term projects, right? It's not a, you know, we're going to be going to this beach and doing the cleanup for the next six weeks and, and what, you know, that's, that's not going to work for young adults who really want to be able to not overcommit to something um, but, you know, can they feel like they can test something out or that they can do a, a large amount of good in just one, one event. Um, so having short-term projects is great and encourage them to invite friends as well um, to know that, that that can be a community building and relationship building experience too. When you use your social media, tell stories on them. And um, stories is underlined because do not tell epics, not great novels with, that are extra, extremely lengthy and wordy. They don't want to know the whole history of, of what's going on here. But you know, this is, this is what's going on this week. This is the event we're going to feature. This is the, the, the saint of the day that we want to highlight for you. Um, they, young adults do like getting things in small packages on a daily basis rather than having like, for example, a homily to read every Sunday. That, that could take a, a long amount of time, but having um, you know, daily reflections and that sort of thing could really attract um, young adults. Um, also, they are not, they tend to be more cause-oriented in, cause than institution-oriented. So make sure you consider that as well, um, not to highlight, this is what we do as a church, but 
you know, this is the, you know, we're looking at human trafficking right now. Um, this is this is what we know about human trafficking in San Diego County and that sort of thing. And that can really get um, young adults animated. Um, having multiple goals also, these this generation is big on multitasking. It's not just a rosary. It's not just a pizza party. It's not just, you know, it's it can be multiple. It can be food. It can be a talk. It can be a prayer. It can be planning session for the next event. It can be the hike that's going to, the, the walk around the, the beach that's going to happen afterwards, right? So it's, it can be a very, um, uh, a get together does not need to be, um, need to focus on a single dimension or a single project. And um, also understanding the difference between welcoming and belonging. I have had adults, young adults, who have talked to me about, you know, I really felt like I was welcome in a parish because they extended um, a, you know, a, a welcome breakfast or a register and then we'll, we'll get together and then we'll meet and we'll see what you're interested in. Um, but they didn't have a sense of really belonging. Like, so there was this really warm reception of the first initial inquiry, but there wasn't like the follow up and we want to really involve you and integrate you into these sorts of things. Young adults are not looking for kind of the shallow sort of welcome. They're looking for something much deeper. Um, a, a sense that that who they are matters and that the relationship that they could share with you matters as well. So that is, that's another important piece to keep in mind. And then the last piece is to really to let them lead. And I added an extra really in there at the end. Um, young adults like creating things for other young adults. They, they have learned what their strengths are. They've learned what their limits are. Um, and they're ready to put their skills and talents to use. They're a generation that, ha that has much more schooling than previous generations have, and they're ready to put it to use. So give them, a, some, them some space, um, give them some freedom to fail, and you know, just, just see what sort of things that they can come up with on their own. And then finally, I wanted to leave you with some questions, um, just some things to think about to get you started. After everything we've talked about tonight, what are some things that you can kind of ponder for yourself um, and your own context and, and reflect on? So the first uh, kind of constellation of questions is who are the young adults in your area? And what are their needs that are not being met? Um, if you aren't sure, how can you begin a needs assessment? You know, how can you start to figure out what the needs are of young adults in your area? Um, what are your gifts? You know, what, what do you personally um, have to offer young adults? And what about those of your parish or your deanery more broadly? What are the things that you as a parish, you as, you as a ministry team, you as a deanery, and different levels of you that are there, and what do you do well? And then will you be able to be honest about what your parish or other um, team, group, deanery cannot do, right? So there's something to be said for specializing versus generalizing, right? So knowing, say, maybe we can't be the generalist organization. Maybe there's not enough resources, talent, that sort of thing to, to serve every single young adult in the area. But what are we really good at? And what sort of young adults could we really feed? Like, and let's see how we can really pour our energies into that. And maybe we can connect to another group who could also feed another um, you know, group of young adults with other needs and, and different sorts of questions and hopes that they're facing. And then a final piece is, so what does a uniquely Franciscan approach to young adult ministry include? And, you know, and whether you are um, Franciscan capital F or uh, Franciscan lowercase f, um, we're all, we can all embrace a lot of these Franciscan ideals and approaches and values and consider how they might affect the way we approach young adults, especially we, as we talked about earlier, um, through listening, learning, and accompaniment. And so um, thank you very much. Um, if you wanted to get in touch with me, contact me for any other things, you can do that at the email listed here, and you can read a little more on my research on my website as well. So thanks for attending.